Are you a damsel in distress? Did you accidentally kill a secret lover? Well, call Billy Flynn. He's the man that'll get you out of any pinch possible. All you need is $5,000, and he will guarantee that you will never see the chair and you'll get away scot-free. In fact, I believe they have a musical number here to help in their advertisements, so let's let that roll. Come on, babe, why don't you hire Billy? Don't be a spaz. I'm gonna do what you need and roll my sleeves up. Don't be a spaz. Write the check. I know the system best. The chair won't happen even though you shot him in the chest. It's just a noisy show where there's a dumb judge. Don't be a spaz. Alright, great number. So yeah, again, if, if you're a damsel in distress and need to get out of prison, just give Billy Flynn a call. He's your guy. And as a reminder, please, as always, quickly leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts if you're listening there. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a like. Please just quick press pause, leave the rating, then come on back and listen to the rest of the episode. Thanks in advance. Alright, on with the show. Lights, camera, action. And the winner is... Alright, welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast, where we take deep dives into different Best Picture winning movies and years. Uh, this time up, we have a recent, probably the most recent movie we've done in a while, 2002's Chicago beating The Pianist. And then, you know, we'll talk about a couple other movies that came out that year, but that's what we got on deck for today. This is episode, I think, 26 of our mainstream. That's right. 26. Uh, yep. I mean, we've done a couple other bonus reviews, and I've done a couple other things, too, with some friends. But yeah, 26 of this mainstream thing. I think we're hitting a groove with our format. We've kind of kept the same one for a while. Hope we've you didn't changed just jinx us. Change. This might be the worst show yet. <laughs> Don't put that out there. <laughs> You, you're My bad. rooting for us to fail here? Quit, quit the, with the negative waves, right? Yeah, that's your own motto from yep. a movie. Yep. Uh, so yeah, episode 26, still going strong. Uh, Matt and Haley here with you as usual. Maybe you'll hear Toby in the background every once in a while too, our little dog. Um, chewing on his bone. He's had a bad day today, so if he gets rambunctious, that's par for the course for him today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, what have we been up to in the last couple weeks? Uh, let's see. What have we been watching, reading, or whatever onto our usual first segment? Um, we, we've been watching a lot of Psych recently. Um, part of that because uh, NBC's new streaming service Peacock came out. What was that last week, I think? And they have the new version of, or, like, they have the new Psych movie on there, so we've been, like, kind of power watching to, like, get through it so we can watch the new Psych movie, which I'm excited about. So, that's been fun. They've had some really good episodes. Um, we've been watching, what, is it season six and seven? Seven and eight? It's we're last, we're in the last, seasons. We're, yeah, I say we're in the last <laughs> season right now, yeah. which is a shorter season. Yeah. And then we'll watch the first movie. Which is, I've seen, but it's on Pe Peacock because you haven't seen it. No, I have seen the first movie. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I think I watched, like, a few of the final episodes with you when it aired and then the, the movie when it, the first movie when it came out. Mm -hmm. I don't remember much from it, though, so it'll... Yeah. Great show. I love, I love this show. I watched it, like, live when it was actually airing on TV. Mm -hmm. I just, I think it's hilarious. It's kind of, you know, USA, it's fr from the USA Network and... It's funny, and some parts of the actual investigative parts of it probably aren't realistic, like most cable shows, mm -hmm. even like Monk, some of the other ones, like, yeah. okay, like, Santa Barbara probably doesn't have a hundred murders a year for them to investigate, <laughs> right. and they aren't really gonna 
solve it the ways they do, but I don't care. It's funny and yeah. uh, you know, do uh, Julie du- Hill's character Gus and and Sean Spence, like the two of them are up there with JD and Turk and Abed and Troy. Like it's some of my favorite man cr- or like bromance. <laughs> you know, couples in yeah, TV. Exactly. So that's been fun watching that. Um we also started rewatching New Girl last week. We watched that entire series, but um, you know, we're looking for something new more or less to have on in the background kinda of when we're working or, you know, doing certain projects and stuff. So started New Girl and uh I forgot how funny that show is. So that's been kinda of fun. Um one thing I did over the weekend, I listened to the latest season on 30 for 30 podcasts which is ESPN's like documentary um section and they have their own uh podcast for their sports documentaries and I have loved every single one I've listened to I think audio documentaries are uh just like a fascinating way to deliver documentary stories but uh this last season they had a seven part series called Heavy Metals which was about um Bella and Marta Caroli, who really jump-started, like, USA Gymnastics and um, kind of brought women's gymnastics to the forefront in terms of, like, international competition, the Olympics and stuff, and they, you know, obviously touch on the Larry Nassar sexual abuse stuff, too, and it was um, kind of disheartening, but it was just, like, really fascinating, too. So I listened to that, and it was really enjoyable. Yeah, they just care about winning. (laughs) <laughs> yeah say so that was like one of their lines at the end like you know does do winning and success have different meanings if so like the Corollis are perfect yeah they won they brought all these medals and fame to the u.s women's gymnastics program but at what cost so it was fascinating there you go uh yeah peacock came out like you said the born <laughs> trilogy is on there so i kind of started born identity uh which actually came out in 2002, uh, oh, but I, okay. uh, but I, I, that trilogy is, I mean, it's more than a trilogy. They made two more movies after it, but that core trilogy is, I think, one of the better action trilogy or just trilogies in general out there. Uh, the first one I think is really good too. It's kind of got more of a low budget feel to it versus the next two. Cause you know, the, it, they were so popular. Uh, and then I watched the old guard on Netflix uh, which is that Charlize Theron, you know, they're immortals and have been fighting people for millennia's movie. and Yeah, we brought that up in the trailer park a few weeks ago, I think. Yep. And so, yeah. uh, it's based off a comic book, so I read the comics. It was only nine issues, so I found those online and read them before watching the movie. So I thought it was, it was all right. Um, the parts of the movie that I like are the parts that or from the comic, I mean, a lot of it is almost panel for panel of shot for shot from the comic. So it's it's mostly good. Some of the the stuff they changed for the movie, I didn't love, but I thought it was it was good. It was worth watching. Uh, the writer for the movie is the same guy who wrote the comics, so you know that, that makes a little sense. But I thought that was all right, and I, I hope they they kind of leave the ending open for a sequel, which I hope they do because I think the sequel would be more interesting than the first one because in the comics i think it's kind of two different stories the first five issues are basically what this movie was and then the next four issues are like season it's like season two or or whatever of a of a show so i hope that the sequel would be that storyline and i think it would be more interesting so uh that was pretty good and yeah just been watching uh, I watched Raising Arizona, I've just been watching movies mainly for, like, from 2002, which we'll talk about later, but that's all that I've been doing lately. Alright, and then for the trailer park today, really just one entry, there weren't too many, I didn't check today, we're recording on Tuesday the 21st, uh, I didn't really check today for any new trailers, but... Before today, just the one kind of came out and it is a Netflix movie since there's only streaming movies coming out these days. And it's Project Power starring Jamie Foxx, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It was or was or is directed by Henry Jost and Ariel Shulman. 
and comes out on Netflix August 14th. So this is one thing I do kind of like about Netflix. They'll release a trailer and the movie's only three weeks away from mm-hmm. being released usually. Right. So this is a different different kind of superhero movie. A little bit. Of, I saw a friend of mine uh, that I messaged with everyone. So he said he sees this as a mixture of Limitless and Push. If you've ever seen Push. It's a, mm, I'm not familiar with Push. It's a... Um, Chris Evans movie, Dakota Fanny movie from the late 2000s. But, yeah, I mean, I, Limitless feels to it, obviously. Is, so, Project Power, different, when you, there's pills that exist in the world, and when you take this pill, you basically get a superpower for five minutes. So, that's definitely, I get the Limitless feels there, where you take a pill and you get the functionality of your entire brain. So, you're, you know, you're able, and it wears off eventually. Uh, so yeah, what are your thoughts on this Jamie Foxx action superhero thriller? I think, I think it's a super cool concept. At first when, um, like they first introduce the pill, they say, oh, like you get, um, like unlimited power for five minutes. And my first thought was, oh, it's like the Felix Felicis potion from Harry Potter where it's like, it gives you good luck for a certain amount of time. But it was cool that this wasn't just, like, hey, like, it heightens your senses or, you know, gives you, quote-unquote, good luck. But it's actually, like, it'll give you a superpower, not just, like, normal human things. So, that's Mm kind of cool. Um, Yeah, no, I I think it sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, it's I mean, I think this has the potential to be pretty cool. Like, maybe a little bit above the old guard. Uh, I don't think this is going to be bad at any point. Basically, I treat Netflix movies these days as like, okay, they're going to be entertaining. They'll be fun to watch. How good the plot or storyline is will vary. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't think it's going to be bad by any means. And I hope it's really good. I like the aspect where they're, you don't know what your superpower is until yes. you try it. Yeah. Uh, kind of get feels I you, I don't know if you're going to remember this show it's a british show it's going to be a really weird poll that maybe some people will get and maybe <laughs> some people won't get but the misfits yes it was no, a show yeah. i think your roommate in college watched and i remember watching it a little bit that's what like these teenagers get superpowers and then one by one they figure out what their power is and i remember there's one character in that show you you really never figured out what his power was until the very end and it was like he couldn't die. That was what his power was. Mm-hmm. And that's I feel like with Jamie Foxx in the trailer, it seems like you he doesn't know, or maybe he does, and the audience just doesn't know what his superpower is. Uh, and then in the trailer, it's, I think his power is going to be something similar to like the impact of like you can't die. It's going to be something big. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, lo- it looks cool. It seems like his, his daughter is the source of the superpowers or something like that. So there's going to be a, another subplot there. Uh, my thing with Netflix movies, too, uh, I know I mentioned, like, oh, they're, they're going to be at least entertaining, maybe good. This really is no shouldn't have any correlation with Netflix, but I don't expect Netflix movies to have a, a good dialogue in them. Yeah. I think it's Spencer Confidential, which I didn't think was that great. And uh, Extraction had some better dialogue, which is probably why I liked it so much more. And, the, and my problem with the old guard was some of the new dialogue they did or unchanged dialogue from the comics just wasn't good. I get cheap vibes like that. What, like what in the trailer, the woman's talking to Jamie Foxx and <laughs> and he says something like, no, I'm fine. And she looks and goes, yeah, you are. I'm like, oh, they're kind of going for the cheap dialogue there. I don't know about that. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I don't like. I'm just, I'm going to watch it at this point and hope it's good and it'll be entertaining and yep. we'll go from there. That's my attitude with Netflix movies at this point. Yeah, I would agree. And the, I had this in the trailer park. I didn't even ask you to watch it, but it's a new Mutants teaser. And my only comment with this is like, just release the fucking movie at, at this point. What, I, else <laughs> what are you teasing us? Teasing? To release a, te- a teaser trailer after what feels like 10 years and is probably four years of, you know, the first trailer hitting till now and this movie still isn't out. I'm just to the point, don't release a a trailer, just release the movie. I think there's a contract 
where they just can't release it on streaming. I think a lot of people are going, just release it on streaming, release it on streaming. I think there's a contract with Disney and Warner Brothers, or or, or not Warner Brothers, uh, Fox. Mm-hmm. Uh, War- the contract says it has to be in theaters, so I think that's why it hasn't hit yet. But, oh my god, I just... I don't know why they're releasing a trailer. It's not scheduled, I think, to come out until this says August 28th, but at this point, everything just gets pushed back. I don't even include that stuff in news anymore. Like, oh, no. this gets delayed. till Tenet just got delayed again. Like, everything is going to keep getting delayed. Yeah. So, I I so I don't know. I We didn't need to talk about it. There's some new scenes in it that are cool. They, you know, one of the characters is Magic is, like, her superhero name, and they make reference to that, like, oh, that's magic over there, and she goes, so am I. Like, oh, cool, nod to, like, what your superhero name is, but, like, other than that, whatever. Just release the movie at this point, <laughs> so that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Sounds good. What do we have for news this week? Uh, kind of light on news. Uh, one, because we're doing 2002 for our Best Picture winner and, you know, look at in the year of film. And there's going to be a lot there to talk about, so I was going to go a little light on this, but, I mean, this is somewhat interesting, you know, speaking to Netflix, just keeping that going, but uh, the Russo brothers are going to be directing Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans in a Netflix assassin thriller. Uh, I just, I threw this in there, I mean, those are giant names, right? Russo brothers coming off of, you know, the last two Avengers movies, and they had a hand in Extraction, Mm -hmm. uh, but... Chris Evans, Captain America, and Ryan Gosling, great actor. They're going to be working together. So where is this on your excitement level or caring level? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. Um, like you said, just those names together sounds like they should put something together somewhat successful. And like you said, kind of our expectations for Netflix movies at this point is they're likely going to be entertaining. They're probably not going to be the best movie of the year, but I think it'll be good. Yeah, I mean, the Russo brothers, I mean, they aren't Academy Award winners or anything like that, but they've made a lot of good movies, mainly Marvel movies, but gives me hopes that this would be on the better side of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, both Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans, I think, are really funny, too. That maybe doesn't they don't come out in a lot of their, their roles, but... I think Ryan Gosling from The Nice Guys, and I think he was just hilarious in that movie. And Chris Evans, maybe not in his roles, but from what I've seen in interviews and offset things, he's a really funny guy too. And Mm -hmm. the Russo brothers uh, were big players in both Arrested Development and Community. Oh my gosh. So, so I I don't know, like, assassin thriller, it isn't going to scream comedy to me, but I... They'll probably have some moments. I hope so. I'm just, I'm saying I hope so because I think that would add, you know, a little extra to, you know, just an action movie. So kind of hopeful there. Mm Mm-hmm. For sure. Mm Mm-hmm. And then, uh, last bit of news, uh, like I said it, I think last time we recorded, I feel like I've been doing this like every 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 episode episode at this point, but another, uh, R.I.P. Kelly Preston. Uh, she passed away, I think kind of, maybe not unexpected to the family, but to maybe the rest of the world because they were keeping it under wraps, but, uh, she passed away within the last week or two at the age of, what was it, she was born in 1962. She was like 57 or something I thought I saw. Yeah, so 57, so way well, too, obviously way too soon. Yeah, that math does check out. Yes. Okay. She just hasn't had her birthday <laughs> this year. Yep, yeah. yep. <laughs> double check. Yep. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I famously, I mean, some of her big roles that I can think of were Jerry Maguire. She was the one that Tom Cruise broke up with in the movie. I always think of her in For Love of the Game, which is, I think, it kind of an underrated baseball movie. Uh, but yeah, married to John Travolta. And, yeah, let's see, she passed, uh, diagnosed with breast cancer two years ago, and, yeah, they kind of kept that quiet and under wraps, and that's, you know, she passed away with complications with that, obviously, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, it was really sad, and like you said, not necessarily unexpected. 
to their family because they knew she was dealing with that. But yeah, they kept um, her battle out of the public eye. So yeah, definitely caught me off guard. Um, yeah, I was kind of looking into, yeah, some of the projects and like the work that she's done in her acting career and um fascinating that she was like she was born in hawaii she had she's noticed that yeah yeah she had traveled like all over the world living different places with uh, her family as she grew up which um kind of fascinating and one thing i had totally forgotten about that her and john travolta are devout scientologists yeah so i i saw that your notes there so i will never forget that john travolta is a devout scientologist because of just like South Park and other references <laughs> like that. Yeah, but it's true. weird that like you forget to think of those people's spouses also being like having that same faith or mm-hmm. being part of that same mm-hmm. organization. Like uh, Tom Cruise has been in Scientology for how long? So I, I assume even when he was with Katie Holmes, they were, t- so it's like, was she like a member of it too? I don't know. It was just mm-hmm. a random thought. You're right. I, I didn't even think of her being a devout Scientologist, too, yeah, but... Yeah, um, and, you know, they, their first son, Jet, who passed away, what, a number of years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, he had some uh, health complications when he was born and just other kind of developmental issues throughout his life, and they credited Scientology with kind of helping him specifically with, with some of his struggles and just the family getting through stuff. So, um, you know, they talked about how the Scientology faith would play into her funeral or certain thing. Really didn't seem like it was, it, you know, it seems pretty traditional to other funerals that you might be familiar with and stuff. But yeah, something I had kind of forgotten about. And um, obviously it's not like the most important thing about them, but uh, was just something that, like I said, I hadn't crossed my mind and uh, kind of read up on them and their family some more. And it's just, uh, yeah, sad to see her go at, at a young age. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's all I got for news. It's going to be a light uh, news day or last couple weeks. Uh, but that was just so we'd have more time to dig into or dive into 2002 year in films. So, first thing we have is our breakdown of the Best Picture winner coming from that year, and that is Chicago. So... It is another musical. We did a musical last week or two weeks ago. Did you want to lead us down the rabbit hole that is this film? (laughs) Sure. Um, So yeah, quick little uh, one sentence synopsis here. So two death row murderesses uh, who develop a fierce... Murderesses. Murderesses. What a word that is. Isn't that nice? Who (laughs) develop a fierce rivalry while competing for publicity celebrity and a sleazy lawyer's attention 1920 chicago easy yes it is full of i did not come up with words. that myself so <laughs> if you like it actually if you like it then i did if you didn't like it i took it from somewhere else so <laughs> that's how that works um uh yeah it was directed by rob marshall uh screenplay was done by bill condon it was based on the book um by bob fossey who's like legendary choreographer um, stars Renee Zellweger as Roxy Hart, murderous number one. <laughs> uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones plays Velma Kelly, another female murderer. Uh, Queen Latifah is one of their fellow prison inmates. She kind of goes by Mama is her nickname. Is she an inmate or is she like in charge of them? I can't even remember. I, okay, I was a little confused, but I... She like has an office in her stuff right okay yeah you're right maybe so on my rewatch i didn't like watch it that intently so maybe i should maybe i should have uh so we've got queen latifah in here uh richard gear plays uh renee zellweger's attorney his name is billy flynn and then john c Riley plays um uh, renee zellweger's husband in this his name is amos amos hart so those are kind of like your main characters, main uh, actors. This film was nominated for 13 Academy Awards. I was going to look and see if that was the most that year. I'm going to guess yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. I think 13 second, is a lot. I think second was Gangs of New York with 10. Okay, gotcha. Um, so yeah, it was nominated for 13. It won six Oscars that year. It won for Best Picture. Catherine Zeta-Jones won for Supporting Actress. Also won a number of technical categories for set decoration, costume design, film editing, and sound. 
The other nominations it had, uh, Renee Zellweger was nominated for lead actress, John C. Riley for supporting actor, Queen Latifah for supporting actress, uh, Rob Marshall for director, also nominated for adapted screenplay, cinematography, and an original song. Yes, yes, yes. Lots of nominations and awards. I mean, it makes sense. This is kind of... Well, maybe it didn't make too much sense at the time, which we'll get... I mean, I'll get into it now, but this film is credited with being, like, bringing musicals back into the fold. This is the first time a musical had won Best Picture since Oliver in 1968. Ooh, wow. And if you really think about it, in the 80s and 90s, not a lot of musicals really came out. Like, can you, can you think of any big time? I mean, when was Victor Victor Victoria? That was in the sixties. No, 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 it was no. eighty two. Yeah, that you're was right. part of our yep, like Gandhi yep, yep. review. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like splashy big time musicals, they kind of faded away. And uh, this film, along with uh, let me bring up my notes here. So this, along with Moulin Rouge. And, I mean, I'm reading this from Wikipedia, but this also credits 8 Mile, which I don't really consider a musical. There's just a lot of music in that movie, in 8 Mile. But it says, uh, Chicago, along with 2001 musical Moulin Rouge and the hip-hop-centered film 8 Mile in 2002, is widely considered to be responsible for ushering a uh, re-emergence of the musical film genre in the 21st century. Because, I mean, if you think about it, since then, there's been a decent amount of musicals that have come out. I mean... Oh, yeah. Phantom of the Opera, Producers, Rent, Dreamgirls, Hairspray, Sweeney Todd, Les Mis. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can go on and on. So this film, to its credit, like, it won Best Picture. Uh, it feels like a big-time event, and it kind of brought in, or brought back musicals, in a sense, which... Fascinating. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I, that's all I was saying. Maybe at the time it didn't make a lot of sense to get 13 nominations, but I feel like these days if you make a good musical, it's usually gonna get some nominations i mean just like cats right? yes bring it on did i not mention uh, cats in my list of uh, as, oh man no we don't need to mention that movie okay but yeah. moving on. um uh, so, but yeah 13 nominations uh one six so this is based obviously on the musical i think it uh, wikipedia says from 1975 but Basically, it is uh, Roxy Hart, played by Renee Zellweger, has these dreams and aspirations to become a big-time star on the stage, like one of her idols, uh, Velma, who is played by Catherine Zeta-Jones, who, I mean, right away, at the very beginning of the movie, we find out she is also, like, hungry for attention because she does this act with her sister, and she just murdered her sister. Like... She walks into the stage and says, my sister isn't showing up, hides the gun that she killed her with, and goes on stage and does her show. Uh, but Renee Zellweger, or Roxy Hart, is wanting to be on the stage and be a star. She's even, she's married to uh, Amos, right? Yep, Amos. I keep wanting to call him Andy, because that's what Billy Flynn always calls him in the movie oh. by the wrong name. Um but she's married to John C. Riley's character and is sleeping with McNulty from The Wire <laughs> yeah. to try to get a deal with a stage manager. Turns out he's lying. He just wanted. He was just lying to sleep with her. Shocker. And uh, so she shoots him out of rage and then goes to jail. And then the rest of the movie is kind of this battle between her and Velma and even a couple other characters of they just want the front page spotlight. So it's them going to trial or them, you know, lying about being pregnant just to, like, have a headline and all this other stuff while all they all have the same lawyer and Billy Flynn, who is Richard Gere's character, who's just, you know, you said it earlier, he's a sleazy guy or he doesn't really care about the truth. He just wants to make money and he'll get you acquitted and move on to the next person. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, in, you know, in the end, they all, the two main girls, the, you know, Roxy and Velma, they get acquitted and then they, they kind of turn into nothing, right? The spotlight's moved on from them onto someone else and they decide to put on a show like, oh, there's no other singing show out there uh, that would have two murderesses and people who have 
been acquitted, so they do this show at the end and their movie and their stars again and in the spotlight, and that's where the movie ends. Um, so I mean, I'll I'll say it like I, I I think this movie's good. It's you know it's fun to watch. It's got some of the best choreography I've ever seen in like any movie, yet, yet alone a musical. Um, especially the the dance, the he had a come in scene where like all the different. Uh, inmates in the cell, like they do a little number and they talk about like why they're in jail and what they did. Uh, that's one of the better numbers in the movie to me, and I thought the choreography was amazing in that. Uh, and I think, and one note I made especially about that song too, like I loved the set for it. Mm -hmm. It was just really cool because it's like you have all these women and just like their normal prison garb, but then like the song starts and it's you know almost like a. Elvis's like jailhouse rock thing where like you have all the bars and stuff and from there and all these different outfits now and mm -hmm. kind of talking about yeah why they killed all these men and why they had it coming so yeah that was one of my favorite scenes favorite songs too mm -hmm. good one yep I think the thing that really kind of holds this back I mean one I've said it before even in the last episode musicals aren't my favorite I don't love it when characters break out in song and dance in the middle of a movie for apparently no reason but i'll say this about this movie they don't really do that a whole lot usually whenever there's a, a dance scene or a musical number it's either a fantasy of someone or it's happening parallel to like what's really happening to kind of give i guess some extra information or background to it so the whole breaking out in song and dancing doesn't really happen in this movie which i appreciate mm -hmm. Uh, but the thing that holds it back for me is that I hate, and I think you're supposed to hate her, but I hate the main character in this. Like, Roxy Hart is just a terrible person. <laughs> yeah, she like, is. I think she's supposed to kind of be the villain, but it, she, here's a woman who, she's married to this nice guy in John C. Riley's character. Is he great looking? No. But, but like, he's a nice guy. He's very loyal to her. I mean, and probably too much, right? Like... She admits to cheating on him, pretends to be pregnant, uh, and then lies to him about it, and he's still willing to, like, do anything for her. And then, this isn't in the movie, but I read in the play that this happens. Apparently, like, right after she gets off of, you know, being, she's acquitted of all charges or whatever, uh, she breaks up, it's like, she divorces him. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that happening in the movie, but I read that that, like, happens in the play or the musical, so, like, she's just a shitty person, and I just, I, I, it's not that you can't have a shitty person to per, as your lead, because not every movie has the best character, right. I get that. Right, But I don't know, there just isn't anything redeeming about her to me. Like, she, like I said, cheats on her husband, and then wants to be on the stage, and then when she kills the guy, uh, you know, McNulty from The Wire, um... She whines that, like, she didn't do anything wrong and, like, I shouldn't be here. Like, what do you mean? Like, you just shot him. Like, you did the thing that they're putting you in jail for. Like, yeah. what do you have to complain about? And she's I mean, just even, super whiny. Even her first night in jail, she's, like, you know, talking to Mama, Queen Latifah's character, and, like, oh, like, it, it's so cold in here. Like, do you have some extra blankets? I'm, like, lady, you're in prison for murder, like... They're not going to wait on you hand and foot. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Yeah, that goes to, like, the whininess that you're talking about. Yeah, and then, and I get that when she asked Velma for help, like, Velma didn't really reciprocate too much. But when Velma goes to her asking for some help, and this is when, you know, Roxy's kind of the big headline at the moment. She's really full of herself. Uh, she says no to Velma, and she goes, oh, I found a clipping of you in the newspaper and she pulls out this pe like this piece of newspaper that she actually like cut out, and it says something like, "Oh, like, uh, Velma's trial has been like postponed or something." And she goes, oh, seven words," and like you took like what is wrong? Like you made that extra effort to find that headline, cut it out, and then bring it up to her. Like, and I hate that uh, she's a shitty, terrible person. But in the end, they get what they want. Like, right. you know, like, like, she doesn't even have to pay for anything she did. Yeah, like, whatever, like, if Billy gets her off of the charges, whatever, but she, she's not in the spotlight anymore, so in the end, she, she doesn't get what her want, like, with that ending, it's like, fine, whatever, but then she does become, like, a big star on the stage, like, she wanted, and it's, ugh, I don't know, I don't <laughs> yeah. know, I mean, like, I could be totally biased in this, or whatever, because I don't, 
love the type of movie that it is, but uh, yeah, I just I don't I don't know I don't I don't like the lead. I like Velma more because she at least knows who she is. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, she does a lot of the same things as if it, she kills her sister and does all this stuff, but she owns up to it and is like, yeah, I did it because I want to be on the stage. Like, that's just that's what I did. Like, okay, if that's a whatever, like you're still a shitty person for doing that, but at least I you own up to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I don't know, what would you think of, uh, like, the two main characters? Or what are your thoughts on the movie? Yeah, they, you know, honestly, I feel like some of the other minor characters had more, like, were more fascinating to me anyway. Not necessarily that they were, I mean, I guess they, <laughs> they tended to be a little bit better, but just, I, like, one thing I appreciate about this movie is, like, each character kind of had their own moment in the spotlight like uh queen latifah had her own musical number and john c Riley did too um you know even richard Gere, like i thought his one song that he did as kind of like the ventriloquist where he has like renee yeah. zellweger like as the puppet like yeah. when i'm preparing for trial like one i don't think he's a very good singer or like performer in this i'll be yeah. honest i don't think he was great. he's no pierce brosnan from mama <laughs> mia right <laughs> oh my god yeah, something like or that. Or Rex Harrison from My Ooh. Fair Lady, if we want to be. Like... Yeah, exactly. They can kind of, yeah, they're all kind of in the same bucket together. Um, but, like, each each of their musical numbers was, like, really fun and I think told, like, a good story of who they were and kind of, like, what their motivations were. Like, John C. Riley's song was, like, him, what was it, Mr. Cellophane. He's like, yeah. you can see right through me, I'm weak, you can step right over me kind of thing, or he's like... He's realizing that, yeah, I'm this nice guy, but that's not really getting me anywhere. My wife's cheating on me. She's lying about being pregnant. She's on death row right now for murder. Like, you know, kind of tells you all of their stories. So I I, I did really enjoy that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, really quickly, speaking of the cellophane part. So here's some trivia. John C. Riley is such a clown enthusiast. Uh, he insisted on designing his own clown makeup for the Mr. Cellophane. It was also his idea to incorporate Amos's application of the makeup during the number. Mm, how about that? So there you go. Never would have guessed that from him because I feel like most people probably think of him from like Step Brothers and like just those like goofy comedies and stuff instead of some of this more yeah, he's serious a, type stuff. He's, so. Well, he's a funny guy. He likes clowns, I he guess. Is, <laughs> that's true, I guess. Um... So, yeah, I mean, some other things I, I liked, but I think this movie is, like, so visually stunning. Like I said, I, I really liked when, I think you made a good point when you said, like, the songs don't just necessarily, like, sprout up out of nowhere. Um, and a lot of times they're kind of built in fantasy, like I said, with the ventriloquist scene, or it's like... Yeah, I did like that, like... Like, that was a good analogy where he's like, hey, I'm going to coach you on exactly yeah. what you have to say and exactly what you have to do. You're going to be my puppet up yeah. there, basically. The songs and dance number were not a reason for me to dislike this movie. Mm-hmm. They're a reason I liked it. It's really just some, like, the characters and other things like that. Why, I, I'm not I'm not saying I don't like this movie. I'm just, yeah. some of the things that brought it down for me. Yep. Um, were the characters and some things like that. The music and dance number is fantastic. You're right, that whole ventriloquist part where, yeah, he's a, he's, he's a lawyer who coached her to... Do, do exactly or say exactly what he wanted. Boom, mm-hmm. that's the perfect metaphor for that. Yeah. Um, I kind of like... So his introduction, Billy Flynn's... In, is, uh, his singing number is him pretending to be a shoe shiner, and then he does this whole dancing number where he doesn't care about money, he just cares about people, but then it's paralleled with him like talking to people, and it's the exact opposite. <laughs> like, oh, it's right. him putting on a show. So, yeah, I, I liked... I liked how they handled the music and mm-hmm. the, the numbers in this. Yeah, like, it, it told people's stories, which I thought was really fascinating. And honestly, the the final number when Roxy and Velma do their show together, we're in their, like, their all-white flapper outfits and their white guns, and they have that huge, just, like, light board behind them. Like, that is just one of the, like, most spectacular scenes I've ever seen, and it's, like... When you think of the movie Chicago, like, that's what I picture is them, like, standing in front of this bright, like, I don't know, light board. Like, that's the only mm-hmm. way you can describe it behind them, you know? Like, they pretend to, like, shoot out the lights afterwards, and it's just, like, oh, it's so cool. Like, they make 
they like really give you that glamorous vibe of like the 1920s flapper kind of thing. Like they have the gritty like murder storyline and like the seedy like Chicago news reporting and media and stuff like that. But they also have the like the flashy flapper kind of stuff at the end, which I thought was really cool. Mm hmm. Uh, some. And they just look hot. What can yeah. they say? Um, I'll say like some things. I, I don't know whether it's just a musical or, or just whatever reason for the movie, but I love courtroom dramas. Uh, and this kind of has that feel to it, right? Like it's them on trial or in jail and to be put on trial. I don't love how they just simplified a bunch of things that happen in court. Like Billy saying objection and the judge says sustained and the opposing lawyer's like, I didn't even say anything yet. Like that would never happen. I get this is a musical. You got to kind of play it up or whatever, but I'm just like, fantasy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, well that's kind of dumb. Or he is questioning, uh, John C. Riley's character and he's convincing him that the baby is his. And it's like the science literally says that if she was pregnant, this would not be your kid. Mm -hmm. Like, they said the last time they had sex, and she said when the due date is, and it's like, mathematically, those don't add up. And it's like, I don't know, the, the, the courtroom scenes weren't, you know, great, but I'm judging that on a very, like, realistic and dramatic <laughs> role. Yeah. And this is a musical, Instead and that of, is yeah. not what, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. so I know that's kind of nitpicky there, uh, but still. One, one, I will say one of my favorite moments from the court scene, though, is when, um, uh, Billy and Roxy, they're kind of like, you know, he's like totally in his groove and he's like, yes, I know what question I'm asking next and you know what the answer is going to be, blah, blah, And he's like, no, please tell the audience. Uh, I mean the jury. Like, you know, yeah. he's like, he's like he playing knows. it up like he's it's just, a show. Exactly. Which I'm going to say this right now, based on this movie, was it just really easy to be a lawyer back then? <laughs> Maybe. Like... Most of this movie... No, I think it's just, you know, the, the focus was not necessarily on how accurate the legal proceedings were. No, but I'm just saying, like, most of this movie is him coming up with a new past for her. Like, there's that scene <laughs> right. where they're, like, questioning, like, where were you born? Oh, I was born here. Nope, you weren't born there. You were born here instead. Your parents? Ah, they're still there, probably sitting on their porch. No, they're dead. Like, you're just completely changing her past and, like, changing the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. Like... Is it just super easy to be a lawyer back then? Like, you just well, make shit up? It's hard to follow through on definitely facts. Definitely harder to fact check. Yeah, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. It's like, uh, you know, Shawshank. Was it just easier to break out of jail back then? Because there's, like, <laughs> cement walls instead of steel walls these days. Uh, right. But no, I had, I'm just like, you're just lying, like, at this <laughs> point. Like, you planted a journal, not a journal, but you planted a f fake lines from a journal to, like, help your case like yeah. that would never actually fly nowadays um and then the last thing i i kind of i remember this like vividly from the first time i watched this movie but i like how the newspapers you know that it takes so long to write a story and to print newspapers they just had to make two different copies like guilty and innocent and yeah. whichever the decision is that's the one you throw out i thought that was kind of cool but um but yeah Anything else? Did you have anything else on this movie? No. Is it we is covered a, everything. As a musical goal, is like it's it's uh, fun. It's it's actually kind of short too. Like uh, last couple of musicals we've Went seen. Went by very quickly. Yeah. Well, it's like, under on, two on, hours long. Yeah, and on the rewatch, it yeah it did it. It went so much faster than I realized. I wasn't paying attention through the whole thing, but. Um, but yeah, it's streaming on HBO Max right now too. Uh, that's where, I mean, we own it on Blu-ray, but we watched it on there anyways, because it was, uh, easier to do. Uh, but yeah, what score would you give, uh, Chicago? I gave this a 7.9. I think it was entertaining. I loved the visuals, the costumes, all that. Um, it's not a movie I need to sit down and watch repeatedly. It was good the second time around. Still, like, I still enjoyed it. Um... But yeah, it's not something I need to watch all the time. So seven point nine. I think it's a pretty solid movie. Mm -hmm. How are you? Uh, I think I'm gonna give it a seven point seven. I liked it more than My Fair Lady. Yeah. The last episode, um, probably because it was a little shorter and a little tighter. Like there wasn't a lot yeah. of like dragginess in between. 
Uh, so yeah, I'll give it a 7.7. .7. I mean, as far as musical goes, it's definitely up there for me, uh, but still not like something that completely blows me away and I can't wait to watch it again or anything like that. So, uh, so that's our breakdown slash review of Chicago. Now let's talk about, do a quick review of what was most likely the runner up that very same year at the Academy Awards. And that would be uh Roman Polanski's The Pianist. So this stars Adrian Brody uh pr and pretty much no one else. I mean there's other credited people, but he is very much like Tom Hanks in Castaway where he is like there's other people in the movie but like you're watching Adrian Brody for 2 plus hours long. Uh yeah, like I said directed by Roman Polanski, written by Ronald Harwood, based on the book by the lead character from this movie, who is obviously a real-life person, but uh, Vladislaw Spielman. I might be saying that wrong. I apologize if I am. I know, and in but, the movie, too, like he kept saying, like, oh, you can call me this, which is his nickname, but I didn't quite understand like yeah. exactly how they said it, so mm -hmm. we, we don't speak Polish. I apologize. <laughs> that is Our correct. Our Polish pronunciation is not up to snuff. Nope. Nope. Absolutely not. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, it's about a, a, po a Polish Jew, uh, like, pianist, hence the title, struggling to survive the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto, like, at the beginning of and during World War II. Uh, it's two and a half hours long. This is kind of a, a big-time war epic. I would definitely classify as that. There aren't, like, battle scenes, so it's not wars in that sense, but it obviously takes place during World War II. It's a lot like Schindler's List, where... You know, no battle scenes, but you're just seeing, like, the effect of the war on, like, mainly Jewish people. And what's different about this is compared to Schindler's List, because I think that's the easiest comparison to yeah. maybe make uh, yeah. as far as other movies go, uh, big time movies, is you kind of get, Schindler's List is like, let's, this is the inside look of concentration camps and the main viewpoint is of a german looking on to like the people this is like you are in with like a jewish person during these times you are in the moment with him so i think you get a better sense of like what obviously what this one person went through but maybe of what was a better idea what was going on especially in the ghettos of that time in poland so I mean, very brutal at times, right? Like, there's times where it's tough to just watch it. Maybe you oh, got, maybe you got to look away. I, um, saying, I definitely did that in a few scenes. Like, yeah. you know what's coming. I'm just like, I, I can't yeah. watch and, this. And I don't know what a big of a deal this is, but I remember the first time watching this and comparing it to Schindler's List, which we don't have to do a whole lot of. This maybe my last comparison point is. So Schindler's List is in black and white. Mm -hmm. So right, wrong, or indifferent, some of those scenes can be easier to watch in black and white because there is no color. It's like yeah. Logan, yeah. Hugh Jackman, they released it in a black and white version, and it's just easier to watch. You don't see the red blood splatter or other things like that going on. Well, this is in color, so it can feel or seem a little more brutal at times, especially For when sure. it's just line these people up and, you know, shoot them in the head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for me, it's it was, it was so raw and so emotional and the thing that was I think so I feel like I need a different word for compelling but that's just all I can come up with right now is like what what kept my attention is that like it was equally heartbreaking but also inspiring yeah like you feel like shit for a lot of the movie but there are these little moments throughout it where you go, oh, like, that's good. Like, like moments of hope. Yeah, and then, you know, in the end, like, he survives, right? Like, he right. makes it. So right. it is, like, you know, good. Cause, yeah, he, he and his family are, um, you know, like, sent to the ghetto in Warsaw, and you see them working and trying to earn some money, and um, he's able to play piano inside this restaurant and so it's like he has these moments of reprieve where he can still do what he loves and throughout the movie that you know once he's like when it's really deep into the war and he's hiding in different places and he has to be silent he has to be quiet like he doesn't have opportunities to actually play the piano you see him just like uh you know sitting in front of a piano not touching the keys but like imagining a song like in his head and moving mm -hmm. his hands around and he 
continues to like move his fingers around as if he's playing it's just like mm-hmm. oh like you know that that's the thing that's like giving him mm-hmm. some some sort of peace of mind and then and then eventually you know so he goes through all this where i really like the stuff at the beginning where it's him and his family and you see like pre-ghetto life and then all, that, all the adjustments they have to do that where, actually was really interesting because i yeah. feel like so often like we just start like oh we're already in the middle of of mm-hmm. World War Two, you're already in the concentration camp. So that was yeah, like seeing this step by step process. Like, oh, Jews aren't allowed to have more than two thousand of their currency, like in a household. Oh, now Jews have to wear these bands on their arms. Oh, now we're forcing all of them into this couple block like area, and we're gonna wall it off. Like seeing that progression was right. I mean, it was terrible, but it was like fascinating to actually see it in movie form. And then so that's like the first half, and then the second half is. You know, they're getting off, sent off to a concentration camp, but someone that uh, Spielman knows sees him and pulls him out of the line that would send him to his death, but the rest of his family goes. So the rest of the movie is him alone, and it's him hiding in different places, those moments that you talked about, but then it, it kind of leads into that moment where he's in this house, full beard, hasn't shaved or done anything in a, in a while, and a German officer finds him, and, like, he's like, who are you? I'm a pianist. And he, like, tells them, okay, we'll play. So this is, like, the first time he's played or touched a piano in forever. And then it's, like... Several years, at least. Yeah, yeah. And then it's, like, this five-minute long just him playing the piano. and Beautiful piece. Yeah, you know, and then, like, he starts crying. And then that German officer ends up helping him with the rest of the movie. And, yeah, like, it's just... It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a very... Very interesting journey, and it was, I think, you know, kind of what sets it apart is it's just the focus on him and how he made it through, and really once, um, like, he got out of the ghetto, like, it was just him. He wasn't, I mean, he had people helping him, but it's not like he had any of his family members with him. He didn't Mm. have any other loved ones, so it really was just him isolated in all these different hiding Mm -hmm. places, and so, I mean, like you said, it's just... It's Adrian Brody on screen for yeah. two, two and, and a half hours. At one point, he's in an apartment where he's locked in it, so he can't even leave. Yeah. So it's yeah. just nuts. Can't even... If he ran out of food and water, or, like, if the water got shut off and he runs out of food, like, he would just die there. Like, he couldn't even leave. But... Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's currently streaming on Netflix. Um, so if, if you want... I mean, it's a fantastic movie. It's obviously yes. because of the subject matter. There are times where it's going to you know be brutal and tough to watch but it's on netflix if anyone wants to watch it which i would definitely say check it out uh we'll review uh reveal our scores in a moment but first uh leading into going into real justice here of chicago versus uh the pianist uh well i i guess first before we get into it i do the thing where i release uh emojis you know on a movie and I was saying if anyone can guess it right, I would give them a quick call out. And there are a couple people that tried, put an effort, which we'll get to, but the first person or uh, account that I saw guess it right on Instagram was a Quantum Week podcast. That's their Instagram account. Uh, and they guessed it right with the Chicago and the pianist emojis. Awesome. Uh, Allie, who is our guest uh, a couple weeks ago, guest the pianist and dot 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 funny she didn't get the musical end of it (laughs) um i think on facebook later on she like correctly said both of them but it was after someone else had already said it uh someone i golf with uh adam says kleba say that name three times fast uh put in a couple guesses i think the first one he said was schindler's list and the piano which if you look at just the two emojis of the pianist which is Star David and Piano. That makes sense. Yes. Uh, but not quite. Uh, so, yeah. just Different wanted, year. <laughs> yeah, different. Well, I mean, the year doesn't matter. I mean, I, I get like him getting those two movies just looking at those two emojis. But yeah, yeah. But look at the whole thing. Uh, so, yeah, just a quick shout out there. Uh, but, yeah, going into real justice. Let's see. Did you just want to... Did you want to do the new thing where we just say which one we like more and then... Okay. All right. So if you want to go first, I mean, we'll do this a little differently. We're still going to talk about the categories that we usually do, but like up front, let's just say which one 
we thought should have won, and then we can give our explanation by incorporating those other categories. So which one do you think should have won Best Picture? Did they get it right or wrong? I think they got it wrong. I think The Pianist should have won. Um, it was just it was such, like I said, it was just such a raw and emotional story. And uh, I mentioned this on the last podcast that I'm not a big fan of musicals winning Best Picture. It's like you're taking something from the stage and point it to film and suddenly that makes it better or different. I don't know. I just think it's kind of annoying. But at the same time, like, I hate when, like, oh, like, you see something, you're like, oh, well, that's an Oscar movie. Like, that's going to win. Like, I feel like that's kind of what The Pianist is. Like, you see it and you're just like, well, that's getting a Best Picture nomination. Like, sometimes that bugs me. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like a hypocrite in a certain way. I think, I but, think movies like that, like, this had a big hit to it like emotional hit to it that i think was worth it yes it's kind of like like i look at a movie like other movies like the english patient where i look that's an oscar baby movie and that doesn't have the emotional like connection to it that i think it would deserve to win best picture okay this yeah it, you know i get it like it's a world war ii movie and it has this big leading character that you follow throughout it so yeah it has tendencies to be like that's an oscar drop but i think it has enough like of a storyline and emotional tie to it that it's definitely worth it okay thank you for supporting my potentially hypocritic hypocritic is that the word opinion <laughs> thank you i mean i'm a hypocrite sometimes too it's <laughs> I just know. i mean it's basically just like we're not film <laughs> like it, like we're enthusiasts and fans but we didn't study film and can cohesively give an explanation to everything it's more like sometimes you just which like one, something because yeah you like, like something. which one did you like more okay now in this moment why did you like that one more it could completely contradict something we said <laughs> two or three weeks ago i know i'm gonna Don't contradict myself me. and I'll, <laughs> right. I'll 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 admit it when i do it but like it's just in that moment yeah this is why i felt that way <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so yeah for me i i just I think The Penis was a better movie all around. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed both of them uh, and enjoyed them for different reasons. But for me, The Penis should have been the winner for 2002. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. I don't think anyone would be surprised to hear me say that. Uh, I do think The Penis is, is like, I think it's just a better movie, but I think it is more impactful too. Like a like a more impactful storyline and just something like I learned more when I watched that movie than I do watching Chicago. <laughs> like you said earlier, like from the technical standpoint, yeah, like Chicago would probably win that out because the set pieces are amazing. The outfits are amazing. The choreography, like all that stuff's amazing. You know, the pianist doesn't lack in that department. They have costume designs and set pieces, like period pieces say, that it, they have to match, you know what I mean? That's something, like, if we're getting into some of the details here in terms of, like, technical aspects, they're both visually impactful, but for completely different reasons. Like, Chicago is so flashy and so perfect, like, in terms of, like, everything is staged out and choreographed, whereas The Pianist, like, it's, you know, everything is, like, soft and subdued and dreary and kind of yeah. rough around the edges. I mean, the there's scenes where the way. characters are in the mud and that even adds a little extra impact to it with mm -hmm. these people just crawling through the mud. So it's like, yeah, like you watch it and it's like the way it was filmed and the style and the color, like it's the way that both movies are done, like totally conveys like the feelings they're trying to get across. It just gives you two completely different feelings. Mm-hmm. No, I mean... Yeah, 100%. So, like, I, they're both strong. I'd probably lean towards Chicago in that sense, but not by a, a ton. Music is actually kind of, like, you go, oh, the musical's obviously going to win, and I would maybe lean towards Chicago, but not going to lie, the pianist, I mean, he is a pianist, so there's going to be yeah. music involved anyways, yeah. but it's, like, a, a more subdued yet dramatic score to it. Uh, you know, and stuff like that. Like, it, again, it's actually pretty close. Like, you wouldn't think it's it, but... It's so close. No, I, I'm, I'm glad we're not necessarily doing, like, a one-by-one one vote on all, like, yeah. pick one, because, as I said, obviously Chicago has some 
fantastic songs in it, and I think they're all so well performed. But the fact that, like, just the concept of music of music and like performance in general is like the driving factor in the pianist, and it's like one of the things that gives him hope. And it's you know when someone questions him like. What are you going to do once this is all over? He's like, well, I want to go back to Poland National Radio and play music on the radio again. Like, you know, he, he isn't even thinking, like, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to do something different. I need to completely restart my life. He's like, no, I want to go back to doing exactly what I was doing before this all started. Mm-hmm. So it's like music has, like, more of a, um, like, intangible, like, aspect to mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. No, it's true. Like, I mean... <laughs> yeah, this was a much harder, like... <laughs> no, but yeah, all music and score, all the musical wins. But it was, I don't think it was that easy. Like, yeah. I would maybe lean towards Chicago because, like, I think the songs were the, the strong point of that movie. But, I mean, Pianist was kind of close there. Uh, so, for writing, I think this might be one of the, the easier ones. I think the Pianist... I mean, this isn't... This is really just confirmed my beliefs. I don't use it as like, oh, this is my decision. But they were both nominated for Adapted Screenplay, and The Mm -hmm. Pianist won. Mm -hmm. So I agree with the Academy in that sense of, like, I think the screenplay for this is more impressive. Musicals, you said it earlier, I mean, they took the stage play and made it into a movie. Like, screenplay-wise, I don't think there's a whole lot there. Like, maybe they, I didn't look into it, but maybe they changed some things for the movie. Maybe not, I don't know. But the writing for uh, The Penis, I know it's based on a book, so there is source material there, but, you know, the way that they kind of bring you along this terrible journey, but still, like, an epic journey, like, through, like, the life of this person going through all this is is crazy. And honestly, like, not with a ton of dialogue either, which, you know, right, wrong, or different, like, I still think it was pretty impressive. Yeah, and, you know, Rowan Polanski said he, like, he tried, really tried his best to stick to Vladislaw's memoir as best he could and really tell, like, the story, how he told it, and I know that, um, Polanski admit, like, he, he put in some details himself, um, like, either that he experienced or, like, his own family did during World War II, so tried to make it as authentic to, you know, the Jewish experience during that time in mm-hmm. that area so um and you can really appreciate how they adapted the memoir into like a very impactful story mm-hmm. uh so then we get to acting which is where i'm gonna i was said i was gonna contradict myself and i'll admit it but it's just how <laughs> i feel in the moment so for acting i actually i think the penis was stronger in this aspect because you get this really tour to like this huge performance from Adrian Brody, like he carries this movie for two and a half hours. Whereas you know in Chicago you have, you know Catherine Zeta Jones who you know she won an Oscar for this movie. Renee Zellweger was nominated. Uh, Richard Gere is always like pretty strong, even though his singing may not have been. Uh, John C. Riley was nominated, so you have three nominated performances and Richard Queen Gere. Latifah. Or Queen Latifah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, let's say you have four nominated performances uh, and then Richard Gere as well I know in the past I've picked movies where I'm like oh there's just more of the better acting over here so I'm going to pick it but I'm definitely like contradicting that right now where I think the pianist was better I don't know if it's just because I think even if you add up all the performances from Chicago I still don't think they would measure up to Adrian Brody so maybe it's just that's why I'm feeling the way I am but I would still pick the pianist for this yeah. But I wouldn't fault anyone for, like, Chicago. Like, I totally get right, it. Right, right, yeah. No, I, I agree on that, too. I think to carry such a heavy load in terms of being, like, really the only character we focus on. I mean, his parents didn't even have, like, names credited to them in the scripts. Like, they were just mother and father. And um, so just being such the primary focus and to have such like such a tough role to be able to play I think I mean he was just amazing and he I was trying to find out how much of the piano playing he actually did in this and he said that he studied piano for hours a day to try I'm sure he didn't I would think I can think of two where I can think where he did it like the opening scene where they they show him playing in the studio 
and then maybe at the end. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the stuff in between is it's a lot of cutting to the the hands on the piano and then his face never in the same shot. And I just have to assume yeah. that that's someone else. Um, but yeah, the fact that but still like he was good on him to, to learn. Yeah, yeah, and just like really, really. I mean, they said he just like he cut himself off from the outside world and really just like dove into his character and stuff, which is. Um, I think pretty commendable. Mm -hmm. He did a good job. Yep. And then we, I mean, we both already said we probably enjoyed the pianist more and think that that should have won Best Picture. So, uh, I mean, the tally for me was still three to two in favor of the pianist. I, I, no matter what the tally would have ended up, I still would have said I think the pianist should have won Best Picture. Uh, you feel pretty similarly, I think. Uh, yep. I gave the pianist a 9.3 out of 10. That's what my score was for it. So, I mean, a lot. I, I do like it. Some parts of it are tough to watch, but it's just overall, I think it's a better movie. It's not super rewatchable, but I think I would still watch it again over Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's longer, too, so that's it's saying a lot, I yeah. guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, I think I'll give it an 8.8. .8. It was. It was just really a fantastic movie in terms of just how it was all laid out and um adrian brody's performance was amazing so an 8.8 .8 for me all right those are high remarks coming yeah, from you so I there know. you go look at me all right so moving on to the 2002 like oscars but kind of that year in film in general i figure i'd take a quick moment here to just talk about what movies came out that year and some of the ones that we watched uh, getting ready for this episode. Uh, so yeah, these aren't, we didn't necessarily re-watch all these, but these are a lot of the ones that came out. Uh, Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights, Pluto Nash, Antoine Fisher, Austin Powers, Gold Member, <laughs> uh, Blade Two. I mentioned earlier, The Bourne Identity, the first one came out. Uh, Crocodile Hunter movie, which I saw in theaters. I, did, oh, I, you did, saw in I theaters, saw yeah. it in theaters, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Britney Spears' Crossroads came oh, out. Oh my god. Uh, country Bears came out, a live action movie where like they're like Country Bears in like those suits. That movie was terrible. Oh, okay. uh, Drumline, <gasps> 8 Mile. I I told you this, it was like two or three weeks ago, I was like, is Drumline streaming anywhere? Because I, like, I really wanted to watch that <laughs> movie and could not find it anywhere. Yep. I still, I think we did find it somewhere. We haven't watched it yet, though. Um, the worst James Bond movie, the windsurfing Die Another Day, <laughs> second Harry Potter movie, Ice Age, Jason X, a.k.a. Jason Voorhees in Space, um, oh, gosh. John Q, Lilo and Stitch, Master of Disguise, Minority Report. <laughs> Master of Disguise. The oh. New Guy, Van Wilder. I thought Wilder. we were talking about good movies. Nope, just movies out. in general. Okay. Orange County, <laughs> Panic Room, that shitty mm. Pinocchio live action movie, uh, Red Dragon, Reign of Fire, uh, Scooby Doo, Santa Claus 2, uh, Signs, Spider Man, which was, I mean, a huge hit, one of the first, like, you know, that kind of so started, yeah, like Superman that. with Christopher Reeves, fantastic, but this is like the first modern, like, good superhero Super movie, movie, and Spider Man's sure. my, one of my favorite comic book characters, so there you go. Um, Super Trooper, Sweet Home Alabama, Treasure Planet, The Tuxedo, which I mentioned a lot in my other podcast with uh, Quinn and Bo, because we did a Jackie Chan run, and that's a terrible Jackie Chan movie, <laughs> oh, The no. Tuxedo. Okay. Uh, 25th Hour, Spike Lee movie, We Were Soldiers, Wild Thornberries movie, and then... Uh, Attack I saw that in theaters, too. <laughs> there you go. And then Attack of the Clones came out, mm, I saw which is, that is funny, because I saw this on Twitter for some reason recently. But uh, it was an MTV Movie Awards clip of Samuel L. Jackson giving the winner to best fight scene from a movie to Yoda. Because remember, he <laughs> fights yeah. Count Dooku in that yeah. movie in a ridiculous scene, which I loved when I saw in theaters. But now growing up, I go, that's a mess. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a clip of the MTV Movie Awards where Samuel L. Jackson gives Yoda an award and Yoda gives an <laughs> accepted speech. What? Like, as a puppet? Or, like, animated? Like, what? And the award for best fight goes to... Women! Yoda! And 
And George Lucas is actually at the MTV Movie Awards. What in the world? First nomination, first award for... Hey, look, there's Adrian Brody. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is like a puppet. Yeah. <laughs> I love how they just totally up the whole he speaks out of order thing. Like, he speaks in the right order sometimes. So yeah, oh, anyways, that, I saw that on Twitter recently. I thought that the timing on that was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so those are a bunch of the movies that came out. I don't know if it's just because we were 12 or 13 or whatever at the time, but I just versus the 60s where we barely saw any of them but i felt like there was just more movies to talk about with this year uh but we watched some of them so some of the ones that i watched leading into this so the first one is the quiet american which uh michael kane was nominated for best actor which is why i watched it so this is a movie i mean he michael kane's performance is the reason to watch it uh, it's good it's carried by kane uh, I, I will probably never think of this movie again after talking about it on this <laughs> podcast. Um, I, I didn't really see it streaming anywhere. Like, it, it's good. It's fine. If people want to see it for his performance, go for it. I also watched Far From Heaven, which is a Julianne Moore movie. She was nominated for Best Actress for it. So that uh, takes place in, like, suburban family in the 50s in Connecticut. Uh, it takes place in the fall, so you have these beautiful set pieces and, uh, you know, different colored leaves and houses and outfits and everything. But, you know, at the underneath it, the storyline is Dennis Quaid is, like, her husband who comes to grips with his sexuality. And then Julianne Moore can't really talk about it with anyone because of their social status. So she starts this relationship with the State Farm <laughs> Or no, Allstate guy, not State Farm. <laughs> Dennis Haysburg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ser Serrano from Major League. And, you know, they start this... President from 24? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Which I think he was shooting at the same time in this movie. He had to, like, travel oh, back and forth a little bit. That sounds about right. Um, but, so yeah, they spark a, a relationship which causes racial tensions in this, in this town. So, a lot of craziness there. But yeah, I mean, I also, I don't need to go into depth on all of them, but I also watched About Schmidt, The Hours... Uh, and the uh, Y2 Mama Tambien, which is a E2, e, sorry. E2 Mama Tambien. Uh, E2 Mama Tambien, which is an early Alfonso Cuaron movie. You know, probably he's now won two Oscars, but this was uh, even before he made a Harry Potter movie. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of a different ish coming of age story these two teenagers who go on a road trip with like an older woman and they kind of have these life experiences together uh so that was pretty good as well but we watched uh gangs in new york together yeah i had never seen that before and i'd always wanted to and you said hey this movie came out this year i said perfect let's watch it yep perfect excuse to like finally sit down and you do don't it. need an excuse no i don't but it was like <laughs> but yeah it's motivating more motivating to yes watch it. there you go that's the right word uh Motivation. so yeah, if you haven't seen i mean that's a martin scorsese movie who's my favorite director it's a three hour long event i would call it then Leo plays uh, Amsterdam Valen, who is, he's being reformed uh, at this reform school for most of his life, because his dad had, was killed by uh, the other lead character, and Bill the Butcher Cutting, played by Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, but Leo, like, plans, he wants to kill Bill the Butcher, but then they kind of have this relationship that makes that decision a little harder. I think it's Daniel Day Lewis's best performance of his career. He's so good in that. And um, best New York accent. Best I love it. <laughs> best New York accent. Yeah. No, and this, he's he's good. And, he's so good in that role. And this brought him out of retirement. He had been retired for a number of years, and Martin Scorsese brought him back, and I think mean, he knocked it out of the park. And this is, I think, the turn from childhood Leo of like when I watched Titanic or <laughs> or What's Eating ba Gilbert Grape, baby obviously. Leo. Yeah, or even Catch Me If You Can, which came out the same year. Like, I, that's, like, baby Leo to me. I think this is the first adult Leo. Because his next role after this was another Scorsese movie in The Aviator, which I kind of view as adult Leo, too, and then The Departed and 
obviously adult. So um, this movie, I think, is I think people would consider it a top tier Scorsese movie, but it, I think it's actually kind of underrated too, as far as he goes. I mean, it goes to show he's just made so many great movies, but but maybe it's because it went 0 for 10 at the Oscars this year or in 2002. Like maybe that's why it's maybe kind of underrated for him. I compare it a little bit to The Color Purple and Steven Spielberg. Like that's I think that would be a top tier Spielberg movie, but it went 0 for 11 at the Oscars. And you know when you say Spielberg, you think Raiders and Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan or Raiders of the Lost Ark. You don't necessarily think of The Color Purple. I think it's kind of the same thing with with Scorsese here. The last one I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit, I finally, not that I had to force you to watch or anything, but I finally got you to watch Spirited Away from Hayao Miyazaki, which I love Hayao Miyazaki and other uh, movies from Studio Ghibli. And this is obvious, this one is usually the one that people, you know, what's the best Studio Ghibli movie or Hayao movie? This is usually the one that gets brought up. Uh, So yeah, what did you think of that movie? Um, I really enjoyed it. It was, um, it, it was, like, we talked about a little afterwards, it was, I think what made it different is that there wasn't necessarily, like, a right or a wrong or, like, a bad versus good. It was just, like, a fantasy adventure story mm-hmm. that this little like girl the, goes on. Here's this girl who gets kind of stuck or caught up in this magical world and... Let's just watch or interact with these creatures and things and all these different uh, yeah, scenarios. She has to bathe a, like a mud monster at one point, but it turns out to be a river spirit. And it's a metaphor for pollution because, you know, it, it looked like a sludge monster because of like all the garbage that was in the river. Like, I don't the creatures are amazing. The animation's amazing. It, it did win. Uh, best animated feature yep. for the year. It actually came out, I think, in two thousand one, but maybe because of the release dates, like it was maybe originally released in Japan, at, like early yeah, two thousand one, like and maybe the in the English U.S. Version. later. But for whatever reason, it was up for the two thousand two Oscars, and I, I mean, I love rewatching it. Was just fun for me. I loved it. Oh yeah, and it's it's a different style in an animated story where it's like. You know, most people are familiar with Pixar, where it's like, yeah, these are kid movies, but they have, like, adult jokes that it's like when, you know, it's like you watch it now, and you're like, oh, as a kid, that totally went over my head. But I feel like this is, like, it appeals to children and adults in a completely different way. Like, it can, like, the same exact story, the same exact dialogue can have an impact on kids and adults in just, because of your different life experience, like, impacts you different. So I, I like that it's... It's not just, oh, here's a kid's movie with some, like, joke humor here and there for adults to, like, pick on and enjoy only themselves. Like, I really anyone of any age could sit down and enjoy this and take what they mm-hmm. want out of it. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought the music was... Th- this is one thing I told you, like, I think because the, um, uh, like, the no-face spirit. Yeah, yeah. Had always kind of creeped me. Like, I'd never seen this movie before, but I'd seen that spirit or that character before. And it always kind of creeped me out. Um, But, like, the music conveyed, like, exactly how you should be feeling. So, like you said, this girl kind of gets sucked into this supernatural world, fantasy world. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so scared for her. What's going on? But all the music was, like, kind of calm and just, like, she was being brave and trusting the people she talked to. I'm like, I guess she's okay. Like... The music's telling me she's okay, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. So I liked that when I, like, yeah, when the spirit was, on, the no-face spirit was on screen, it's like, it kind of gave you um, perspective on, like, what the character was actually doing. It's like, oh, okay, this thing isn't necessarily bad or good, but, um, yeah, just kind of helped with, like, explain their story. So I really mm-hmm. liked how, like, there was literally music from, like, start to finish in the whole thing. I think mm-hmm. that's really cool. Yeah. So. They don't do that whole lot, so I kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll get you to watch other Studio Ghibli movies. I say I saw part of um, what was it the the neighbors the t- Totoros? Yeah, the, was that was like called? a bunch of vignettes that were yeah. kind of stringed together. Yeah, that I one thought... I had no idea if I was gonna like or not, and <laughs> I, I actually enjoyed I know it that's a lot. not like a tr- like the most like 
like, I feel like when you hear, like, Miyazaki films, Studio Ghibli films, you think of this, and Princess Mononoke, even Ponyo, um, I feel like those are all pretty big, but the mm-hmm. Neighbors Totoro one, I'm like, I had never heard of it, but it was really cute, it was really enjoyable, mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, I think that the entire Studio Ghibli collection is on, like, HBO Max. Not then, not the entire but thing, but, like, the good ones that most it. people would want to watch, so yeah, that's where, I mean, I own most of them anyways, but yeah, for streaming purposes, go, you know, check out HBO Max, or m- mostly on there, Spirit Away is on there, the... Princess Mononoke is on there. All the big name ones yep. are on there. So, um, another big movie that came out that year too is My Big Fat Greek Wedding, mm-hmm. which um, I don't like this. That's the movie I've seen the most in theaters. I think I saw that movie four times in theaters. That's the most I've ever seen any movie in the theater. Um, but I just and uh, I should have looked this up, but it's like one of the like most successful like box office films on such a low budget with basically like no one had ever heard of thing <laughs> um so thank you tom hanks and rita wilson for producing that <laughs> yep i went and saw the sequel with you in theaters which oh yeah that's right it, it was, was okay it was fine it's kind of it's like zoolander where it just don't make a sequel yeah. zoolander 2 not great yeah. either no which but i yeah. think zoolander came out in 2002 as it well it came out in 2001 oh okay because it was supposed to come out the week of September 11th. I remember they pushed it back. Oh, okay. That was actually... That's the only reason why I quiet, remember that. Quiet American was supposed to come out in 01, too. They actually did mm. test screenings on September 10th. Eh. But then, like, one of the, the twists that happens in the movie is, like, a terrorist aspect. So they're like, okay, let's shelve this yeah, for a year. let's not. Yep. Yep, that's probably a good choice. Okay, so yeah, those are some movies we watched leading up to this. So now let's dive into the 75th Academy Awards and a retake possible retake of these different categories so the the first two probably i'm not going to change anything but i wanted to at least bring them up anyways and that's a screenplay so why don't you start us off with the adapted screenplay yeah so nominees that year were about a boy adaptation thief chicago the hours and the pianist was the winner yep and this is you know we talked about it i we talked a little bit in Real Justice. I think the pianist writing was really, really good. Like, maybe I would have said Adaptation could have won over uh, the pianist because that's a uh, it's an interesting take where the writer of this movie, so Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman, like, they couldn't figure out a way to adapt the book The Orchid Thief. So what they did is they just, they took their problems with adapting it and turned that into a movie. So, like, the movie is about Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman trying to trying adapt to adapt this story. into a movie. Like, that's what they did. So it's kind of an interesting take. So yeah. I actually wouldn't have had a problem if that would have won Best Screenplay. Uh, but And I'll say About a Boy, I don't know if it really has too many other nominations. That's a pretty good movie, too. That's a Hugh Grant, Tony Collette, like, you know, uh, that's Nicholas Holt. And it, he's the kid who, like, just keeps going to Hugh Grant's place, and that's, like, his father figure, and Hugh Grant's his bachelor who so has Nick, no so idea. So Nicholas Holt is the kid in this? Yeah. That's I'm pretty I, sure, yeah. That's what I... Okay, it's funny, because in Gangs of New York, the kid that plays, like, baby Leo at the beginning, I'm like, is that Nicholas Holt? And you're like, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Looked it up, turns out it wasn't, but that's so weird that I had mentioned, oh, I wonder if that's Nicholas Holt, and it turns out he played a kid in a different yeah. movie the same year. So, weird. Yeah. That, that movie is really good. I just wanted to bring it up because I don't really think it had too many other nominations. Uh, but yeah, I would maybe pick Adaptation to win over The Pianist, but I did think that that screenplay was pretty good as well. Yeah. Uh, so the original screenplay nominees that year were Far From Heaven, Gangs of New York, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, Hello, Good Job, Nia Vardalos, um, E Tu Mama, Tom Bien, and then the winner was Talk To Her. Which, so I have not seen Talk to Her. Uh, same writer, director that did uh, Pain and Glory, which Antonio Banderas got his Oscar nomination for last year, and I went and saw that. And yeah. that, that was really good. Yeah. So it's the same writer, director. Uh, so that's really cool that like Pedro has an Academy Award, and it's for Talk to Her, so I don't really want to take it away from him. But I would... E2 Mama Tampia yeah, was really good. Like, that screenplay, it was really good. So I would maybe lean towards giving that some love. Um, 
But I know my big fat Greek wedding is there, and that's a favorite of yours, so I don't know if you have any opinions on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that would have been so good. That would have been, like, I feel like almost on a level of, like, Marissa Tomei winning supporting actress. Like, that would have been just, like, a huge shocker, I think, especially because I think this was, like, her first screenplay, and it was basically just loosely based on her own life, her own family. And it's well, just, it's like... Diablo Cody won the yeah. like, Oscar for her first screenplay. Mm-hmm. So it's, well, it's just a completely different. I mean, you put that up against Gangs of New York. It's like those movies are so completely different from each other. So that, that's, <laughs> that's why I love I, movies. <laughs> I know. And that's what I love about like screenplays, especially. It's like you can appreciate so many different things about so many yeah. different stories. Those are like, screenplay is like where you give the nod to those small movies for like that was a good movie. We're not going to give you a Best Picture nomination, <laughs> yeah. but, like, that was a good movie. Like, Logan. Oh, uh, here's a Best Screenplay here's a nomination. nomination. My Big Fat Greek right, Wedding. Here's a Screenplay nomination, mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. you know, it's still cool. She did, she did get nominated for um, Best Actress at the Golden Globes in the... the comedy com- section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes Which sense. is kind of cool about the Golden Globes that they separated it out, so you out get, a yeah, a little more... Um, uh, I'm going to wait for you to figure out what you're trying to say. <laughs> oh, this brain is not Notoriety. Working. That's probably not what you're trying to say. No, but like, it wasn't. Just like diversity for diversity. <laughs> That's not even the right word either. Oh my God. This is embarrassing. We'll move on. Yep. Moving on. <laughs> okay. So next we've got Best Supporting Actress. Um, nominees that year were Kathy Bates for About Schmidt, Queen Latifah for Chicago, Julianne Moore for The Hours, Meryl Streep for Adaptation, and the winner, like we mentioned, Catherine Zeta-Jones for Chicago. So, Queen Latifah, great. Like, I, I love the nomination. I mean, she isn't going to get the win, but she's great in her small role in Chicago. Kathy Bates, I finally saw about Schmidt. I was more than halfway through that movie. I'm like, where is Kathy Bates? It isn't a big role, but she owns the screen when she's on it. And there's a pretty infamous hot tub scene where she's just naked and, <laughs> and is hitting on Jack Nicholson in them, that scene. Uh, so way to go all out there, Kathy Bates, I guess. Uh, Julianne Moore, I think, was considered a somewhat of a favorite kind of going into this movie. And I'll talk about the hours a little bit more later. But I, I wasn't blown away by it. It's a subtle performance, but I wasn't blown away by her in the movie. She's good, but not amazing. Um just someone to note who isn't in here for a nomination Cameron Diaz Gangs of New York she got a Golden Globe nomination I, I, I'm fine leaving her out she wasn't yeah. amazing in it but she had a pretty big role in a big movie that year so sometimes that alone will get you a nomination but... right and something more dramatic than she usually does too yeah um but I would I'm fine with Catherine Zeta-Jones getting the win here it's funny I think for most of the award season she was in the Best Actress category with Renee Zellweger, but she kept losing to the eventual winner at the Oscars, which we'll get to. So then for the Academy Awards, I think the the producers or whoever makes this decision said, let's put her in Best Supporting Actress, Uh, and then she got uh the win. Gotcha. But I would have actually given the win to Meryl Streep. Meryl! Yep. You're giving Meryl some love? (laughs) Yep. Write this down, everyone. Matt (laughs) Schmidt gives credit to Meryl Streep. (laughs) Uh, she's great in adaptation. She's the author of, you know, the book that is trying to be adapted. And, uh, yeah, she's funny, dramatic, and emotional in the movie. I think she's fantastic. So, I would have given the win to her for this. Which is funny, because some people said she actually should have been nominated for The Hours, because she's mm, yeah. one of the leads in yep. that, and she's the only one of the three leading ladies to not get a nomination for that movie, but she got a nomination for a different movie, and I think she should have won. Gotcha. Okay. Um, for supporting actor, the nominees that year were Ed Harris for The Hours, Paul Newman in Road to Perdition, John C. Riley for Chicago, Christopher Walken for Catch Me If You Can, and then the winner went to Chris Cooper for Adaptation. Mm-hmm. So, a couple notables who are not in here for the nomination right off the bat uh alfred molina in frida plays diego rivera who is you know frida's husband for pretty much that whole movie you watched that one too didn't yep. you oh i did i forgot to mention that i watched yep. frida as well yeah um 
you know, he, he was great in it. He was in most of them. Like, he was, I mean, he's a scumbag for most of the movies. <laughs> uh, but kind of redeemable by the end, but he was excellent in that movie. And then the big one for me who is left out is Dennis Quaid for Far From Heaven. Mm. Uh, he's, you know, the husband to Julianne Moore who is coming to grips with his sexuality, I mean, in his, like, 40s or 50s, so later in life and at a time period where that really wasn't okay to do. Uh, I mean, they bring him to a reform psychiatrist uh. at that movie who's like, this is a disease and we have to beat mm. it. And it's like, oh, my God. Um, That's tough. Yeah. I mean, I think this is Dennis Quaid's, like, his best acting performance. He's someone who's never been nominated for an Oscar before. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, out of these other nominees, though, I mean, Ed Harris in The Hours... It was actually a lot smaller of a role than I thought it was going to be. Like, I knew that this, that he got nominated for this, and this is actually his most recent nomination. He hasn't been nominated since. Uh, it was actually kind of a smaller role than I thought it would be. Um, Paul Newman, who I love, and I love Road to Perdition. I, I love that he got nominated for that movie, too. I could easily say that that was my favorite performance, and he should have won. Um, John C. Riley is maybe the one you can easily-ish take out for Chicago. He was in three of the five Best Picture nominated yeah. movies. And, you know... Because he was in Chicago. Yep, he was and in... And The Hours. Yep, and then Gangs of New York. Gangs of New York, yeah. Uh, so, I, I, part of me loves... He got an Oscar nomination. I mean, here's this guy pretty much known for comedy nowadays, but there was a time where he was a dramatic actor and he was in three of the five Best Picture nominees and, and the Best Picture winner... And I love that he got an Oscar nomination. And then Christopher Walken, I think, was the favorite going into the Oscars. He had won most of the other, like, ceremony, uh, the other awards. I think he won the SAG Award for this, too. Mm. Uh, going into it, you know, in, from Catch Me If You Can, Frank Abagnale Sr., which I, I love him in that movie. I mean, I love that movie in general. Uh but I, I do think he's... Advertise on the Roku channel all the time. Like, when, it... like whenever I turn, yeah, the TV on and the Roku, it's always like, catch me if you can, free on Roku channel. Yeah. So, That's... check it out, everyone. <laughs> I guess so. Um, I do think he's really good in that, and uh, this is his only other nomination other than his win for The Deer Hunter, so kind of a large span there, nominations, but... I would, I, I'm fine with Chris Cooper winning. He's really good in adaptation. He's this, you know, toothless, like, wildflower hunter who <laughs> um, uh, Meryl Streep's character, like, falls in love with at one point, and he's this pothead, too, so he gets her to smoke pot, and it's kind of funny, and, you know, they kind of, they fall in love. I think it's part of the fictional part of the movie that's not based on the book. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to change this a little bit in the sense of, I think most award ceremonies had Ed Harris in here as a nomination, so I'm going against the grain here, but his role was so small, and I, I don't know. I, 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 got, I feel like I got to take him out. The easy one could be John C. Riley, but I kind of like the fact that John C. Riley has an Oscar nomination. And I just, Dennis Quaid has to get a nomination for that movie. So I'm just trying to give him some love. Alvaro Molina was great too, though, but I think Dennis Quaid needed to get an Oscar nomination. Okay, good. Um, the Best Actress nominees that year were Salma Hayek for Frida, Diane Lane for Unfaithful, Julianne Moore in Far From Heaven, Renee Zellweger in Chicago, and then the winner was Nicole Kidman for The Hours. Yeah, so one, the only notable person I could think of who isn't like in here for a nomination is uh, Maggie Gil uh, Gyllenhaal for, have you ever seen Secretary? No, I haven't. Uh, it's kind of a quirky movie where... It's an indie movie. She wasn't really going to get a nomination for it, but I want to at least bring it up. It's kind of Fifty Shades before Fifty Shades. <laughs> like, okay. She's the secretary to um, James Spader, who's mm. like, mm -hmm. they develop this submissive and, um, what's the dominant. other? Dominant. like, relationship, and she's engaged to someone else, but then leaves him to be with James Spader. And it's this quirky movie. I just want to at least bring it up. But really, <laughs> really the, nom the nominees here are pretty solid. So Nicole Kidman is the best part of the hours. Like her performance is the best. My only issue is she won best actress. 
And I think she has the least amount of screen time out of the three leading ladies. Yeah. Like, I don't see this as best actress. I and I, I think I saw somewhere that they they wanted they had intended for it to be a supporting actress, but they were worried that they were the three of them were gonna split the votes between each other. So they yeah. they picked Nicole Kimmon to be actress because they thought that was the strongest performance, which I agree with, but is kind of weird to me. Like I think it's like twenty minutes of man, it's probably more than that, but like twenty three minutes of screen time in the entire movie or something like that. It's hard for me to give Best Actress to someone who, with that little of screen time. So I would have given it to Julianne Moore cause I, from Far From Heaven. Like mm-hmm. That movie and her role was fantastic to be this suburban, suburban housewife who is dealing with these marital issues but then developing this relationship with her African-American gardener and the whole town is like turning on her for that. Like It was just powerful performance. Uh, Selma Hayek was really good in Frida. Also, I mean, she that basically she just is the movie. Uh, I didn't love Renee Zellweger in Chicago, but I get it. She's the lead in a big movie. She's going to get that nomination. Uh, and then the weird one to me, like I'm not going to change any nominations or anything, but Diane Lane getting a nomination for Unfaithful. I mean, I guess all the power to you. It's her only nomination, but that's a weird movie to get a Best Actress nomination for. I mean... She's having an affair with this younger guy, Richard Gere, another Richard Gere movie, <laughs> kills him, and then they hide the murder together and get away with it, and that, like, makes their marriage stronger. I don't know. It's kind of weird, but, I guess, you know, it is what it is, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts on Best Actress, then? No. That's no. It. I would okay. give it a Julianne Moore. All right. Uh, the best actor nominees that year were Nicolas Cage for Adaptation, Michael Caine for The Quiet American, Daniel Day-Lewis for Gangs of New York, Jack Nicholson for About Schmidt, and then the winner was Adrian Brody in The Pianist. So this is one of the strongest categories I think we've it's huge. done. Yeah. Because there's a lot that were left out here. Here's some of the ones that were left out. The obvious one is Richard Gere for Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I just say obvious because... That had the most nominations, and he was the lead actor in a big-time movie, and he has never gotten an Oscar nomination. So, you know, I think we agreed that he wasn't the best singer or anything like that, so it isn't too crazy he didn't get the nomination, but there's one to note. I watched Punch Drunk Love. Adam Sandler is really good in that. It's a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not surprised he didn't get a nomination because of how strong the field is, but Adam Sandler, I wouldn't have mind if he would have gotten some love here. Uh, Kevin Klein did The Emperor's Club, which he was getting Oscar buzz early in the season for that, where he played like this mm-hmm. teacher at this mm-hmm. like boys school kind of dead yes, poet society. Yes, I remember that movie now. Yeah, Emil yeah. Hirsch was the troublesome uh-huh, kid. Uh huh. Uh, Tom Hanks wrote Perdition. Uh, Leo in either Catch Me If You Can or Gangs in New York. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the one that I I don't think this movie really got any love. Or it should have gotten some, but Derek Luke and Antoine Fisher. Oh, uh, yes. It was a Denzel's directorial debut. That movie is fantastic. And maybe it's because this category was so strong this year, but, like, that didn't get any love. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, out of these nominees, I mean, I think four of these are, like, solid. Like, these have to at least have a nomination, and I think three of them had a chance to win. You got Nicolas Cage in Adaptation, which I, might be his best performance of his career. He had won an Oscar for a different movie, but he is fantastic in Adaptation. I mean, he's playing two different... He's playing two brothers that are just... It's quirky as shit. Yeah. Um, talked a little bit about, about Michael Caine in The Quiet American. Uh, Jack Nicholson in About Schmidt. I watched that for the first time. Like, holy shit, Jack Nicholson is fantastic in that movie. I mean, here's the guy, He's he had won three Oscars by this time, he's already an all-time actor, and here he is turning in this, like, he's normally this loud, volatile, sarcastic, he's just Jack Nicholson in every role, basically, mm-hmm. Yeah. but here he is turning in this, you know, subtle, restrained, emotional role about a, a retired guy who, uh, you know, his wife dies, his daughter hates him, and he goes on this, like, road trip to his daughter's wedding, and... Just kind of has this coming of age. You said it when I talked about this movie, dude. It's like a coming of age story for a retired person. Like, yeah. it's just like he was amazing in this. I think he was the favorite going into the Oscars, 
for this role, um, and he could have easily won. I'll say this really quick too. So there's a, a part of the movie. This is the funniest part of the movie to me. Um, in about Schmidt. In about Schmidt. So his wife passes away. They do the funeral and everything, and he sits down in his chair. And it's a movie that has a narration to it, like Jack Nicholson does the narration. And he kind of says, like, all right, I'm going to be fine. I'll take care of myself. And he sits down in his chair and closes his eyes, and it fades to black, and it fades back, and it says two weeks later. And he's sitting in that same chair, basically the same position, kind of like a metaphor of, like, he hasn't moved in two weeks. Gets up, walks around his house, goes to the dining room. There's just cartons of ice cream on the table, bags of chips all over the table. Like, he's a mess. And while the narration is him writing to a pen pal saying, I'm doing pretty good on my own. But what you're seeing is the complete opposite. <laughs> Not at all the same. He opens the cabinets and flies are coming out of the cabinets. And you look, the camera shows what's in there and it's just a Twinkie. And then an open box of like hard shell tacos. Taco <laughs> shells. Yeah. And he reaches in, grabs a half of a hard shell taco and just starts chewing on it. <laughs> like, I don't know why, but I just thought that was hilarious. Uh, so he could have easily won. Uh, we talked about Adrian Brody and the pianist. Uh, but Daniel Day-Lewis in Gangs of New York, we talked a little bit about that and how amazing he is. I guess the changes I would make is Michael Caine is great in The Quiet American, but I would take him out and put in Derek Luke because I think that movie needed some love, and then I would give the win to Daniel Day-Lewis because I think it was the best performance of his career. This could have easily been any four of these guys, but I would give it to Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's you've a seen, fair take. Let's say you've it's, seen a couple of these. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I did love Daniel Day-Lewis's character and his performance was really good. Um, I, I think there's more depth to Adrian Brody's character in The Pianist, so I would keep him as the winner. Um, one thing that's fascinating is that at 29 years old, he's the youngest Best Actor winner ever, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Um, so... You know, I'm a year behind on winning my Oscar, yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, th that's the only um, thing I guess I wanted to add for the Best Actor category. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at Best Director, uh, nominees were Rob Marshall for Chicago, Martin Scorsese for Gangs of New York, Stephen Daldry for The Hours, Pedro Almodovar for Talk to Her, and then the winner was Roman Polanski for The Pianist. And because he has basically fled the U.S., um, he was not there to accept his award. So. Yeah, so yeah. we didn't really talk about it in the review, but like that's the obvious El elephant in the room is like a guy who, if you were to step on U.S. soil, would immediately be arrested for statutory rape, like one best director. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I so some people left out here, uh, Alfonso Caron for... E2 Mama Tambien, Sam Mendes, Road to Perdition, Spike Jones for Adaptation, Alexander Payne for About Schmidt. Um, I haven't seen Talk to Her, so I don't always, I don't like removing a director or a movie I haven't seen, but I would, I would take Stephen Daldry off of this for the hours. I'll talk about the hours a little bit after we talk about Best Picture, but I wasn't too impressed by that. So I would take him out, and I would put in... I'd probably put in uh, Sam Mendes for Road to Perdition because I love that movie and I think that that's a great follow-up to American Beauty from him. And then I would change the winner. Like, I don't... I'm not giving Roman Polanski the win for this. I would actually give it, and this may sound like a Homer thing to do, but I would give it to Martin Scorsese. I mean, more so than just because I love him, but I think what he did with this movie and... Uh, like how crazy epic it is and all of the fight sequences and um, you know the other aspects to it the historical aspect to it like it, he wanted to incorporate these riots that happened in New York City with this story like what he did with it is just amazing yeah so I would give the win to Martin Scorsese and take it away from you know the statutory rape guy Roman Polanski <laughs> that is fair yeah I um I mean, the Penis is a fantastic movie. All, all these are good movies. Um, but yeah, I would agree with you that Martin Scorsese did a great job with Gangs New York. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean, just because a lot of this was based on real people and real events. and um, like it, it was an original screenplay, but I think just some of the, the fact that a lot of this stuff was based in, in real life stuff, I think he did a good job. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Best Picture nominees this year were Gangs of New York, The Hours, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, which we have not brought up yet. Um, Also, The Pianist, and of course, our winner was Chicago. Mm Mm-hmm. So... Uh, we, we already talked a little bit about, obviously, Chicago and the Pianist and Gangs in New York. So, a uh, movie that I'm going to talk about here a little bit is one that I watched, and that's The Hours. So, I The Hours is it's, it's about three different storylines and three different time periods. Virginia Woolf, Nicole Kidman in, like, 1923 struggling with her mental health and her husband you know her husband moved them out to the small village to try to help her with that but she doesn't agree uh like with that decision then laura brown is julian moore in the 50s another 50s era suburban you know housewife (laughs) Uh, but she's pregnant and living in this stereotypical suburban life with her husband john c Riley. um and, you know, they have a son, she's pregnant with their second kid, but she's just so clearly unhappy with her life. So that's another story. And then the third one is Clarissa Vaughn, who is Meryl Streep in 2001, who is, you know, kind of living her day to day. And her ex-boyfriend slash best friend is Ed Harris. It's, you know, these three different storylines are going on. And, you know, something happens at one point in the movie that kind of connects the storylines with, with a character. So, you know, there is a common character throughout at least two of the storylines. This movie, the performances are amazing. But I was an hour and a half into this movie and I went, nothing has happened yet. <laughs> I am so bored out of my head. Yeah. Nothing, literally nothing has happened. I would say, as you were watching this, like, oh, how was the movie? And that's, yeah, that's exactly what you said. You're like, it's almost over, and I feel like nothing's happened. Yeah. And then, like, it's never a good response. Shortly after I said that, they do the, like, thing where, like, they reveal a character and it connects some of the storylines, and it got a little more interesting. But at the end of the day, I was like, that movie was pretty boring to me. I guess I do think the Virginia Woolf and Nicole Kidman part of it is she is amazing and that part was really good but most of everything else was fairly i i it was hard for it to keep my attention yeah uh so i did not really love that movie a whole lot and Mm -hmm. i would definitely take that out of the best picture nominations and i would plug in road to perdition which if i was going off i'm really surprised that that movie hasn't come up on here more often besides you know of the categories Newman, we look at, yeah. besides Paul Newman's nomination. Yeah, I, I love him. I like him more I than American I saw that Beauty. on here, and I'm like, how is Road to Perdition not in more categories here? Yeah, like, I, I think it's better than American Beauty. I think if I was going off of favorites, which I, I kind of base this off of favorites a little bit, that might be my favorite movie out of these. Like, if I plug that in instead of The Hours, and then I keep the rest of the nominees the same, mm-hmm. that might be my favorite movie out of all of them. All right. Um, but yeah, you said we haven't talked about the two towers a whole lot. It didn't get as, as much love as you know, Fellowship the year before or Return of the King the year after. Maybe it was a little fatigue or something like that. But it still got a Best Picture nomination. Um, but yeah, I, we talked about. I, I guess I would give you know I'm not giving Roman Polanski Best Director, so I would maybe give The Pianist Best Picture here. I already said I would give it Best Picture over Chicago. The only real debate is you know. With Gangs of New York, which I do love, but me, Pianist probably edges that out a little bit. But if I am going by straight favorites, I, I might give it to Road to Perdition. But, you know, probably give it to the Pianist, but I wouldn't sleep on Road to Perdition. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. I like it. All right. Beautiful. So that closes out the retake of the 2002 Oscars. Uh, I guess, you know, let's let's do our top five here. So going with Chicago, we creatively came up with our top five favorite one word yeah. movie titles. And that does not include the word the, like you can't do the Godfather. No, we're or, not including articles like the, no. uh, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, all right, let's see here. I'm going to be kind of doing this on the fly because I didn't actually do a ranking. I just highlighted a bunch of movies. <laughs> so we'll start with you. What was your number five? My number five, assuming that exclamations, count, like punctuation That's fine, counts. I guess. <laughs> airplane. Oh, <laughs> My man. number five is airplane. Um, 
it was really hard for me narrowing this down to five, but um, this movie has always stuck with me and I think it's just, just purely based on how clever it is, I had to have this on my top five. No, that's, that's, that's fair. So I'm starting with Airplane. <laughs> you've been, you've been saying that I need to, that we need to watch <laughs> I need that. I need to rewatch that, I know. Surely you can't be serious. <laughs> All right. I Oh am... my God. I just thought of another movie. Oh, uh-huh. oh well, I guess that'll be my honorable to, mention. So do you no. need to make a change no, here? No, I didn't think of it before the show. It doesn't count. Did you look at my screen? Is that why you thought of it? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, there's two. Well, there's two. Why didn't we commiserate more on our list? Commiserate? That's not the right word. No, it's find, not. I can't find the right word. Okay, that's fine. Um... Converse. There you go. <laughs> Discuss. Right. My son of a bitch. Yep. All right. You're, my list is going to be a lot better than oh, yours. It's going to be so much better than mine. <laughs> my. I'd still keep my number one though. Okay. My number five is Logan. That makes sense. Yeah. That's I. That movie is so good. Yeah. Like not only as a superhero I'm honestly, movie. Honestly, it's not higher. Yeah. I'm but just... we'll see what else you have. Yeah. Uh, it could easily. And all these are going to be separated by like a decimal point or not. But seriously, that's how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. So this For could sure. easily be like, you know, obviously one through five, but I'm just based on my rankings here that I'm looking at. Number five, Logan. I think it's Hugh Jackman's best performance. He should have gotten the best actor nomination for it. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. Um, yeah. Go. I mean, that movie, that's one of, that is my favorite superhero movie. Good choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're going to have a strong list if that's your number five. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, my number four is Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> your list is looking... Shut mm, up! It's sinking, I know! It's sinking like I know, the Titanic did. I know, I know. Well, you should just do your list. We don't need to do my <laughs> list. I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it's one of those, like, it's not as good of a movie as it's however many 10 Oscar wins or whatever shows. But it's also one of those that whenever it's on TV, I can't help but watch it. Even though when it's on TV, it ends up being like a five hour long movie with all the commercials. I just sit and I watch it and I'm drawn in and I can't take my eyes off of it. So Titanic. All right. There you go. Yep. My number four is Alien. Nice. Good choice. Mm-hmm. Good I was choice. debating between, so I don't have aliens on my list. And yeah. Alien 1 and 2 are very close to each other for me. So I, they're pretty I, interchangeable. I would say, I think I like aliens better. Yeah. You could easily talk me into put, making this aliens instead. So yeah. we'll go. I'll go James, the James Cameron one since you have Titanic. <laughs> yeah. So aliens. Aliens <laughs> okay. for me is number four. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's one of the best action movies of all time. Like, I love how they went from horror movie in the first to just straight up action movie in the second. Yeah. And they just work. Like, you just flip genres, but they made it work. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Very cool. Okay, good choice. My number three. Okay, so here's the thing. Like, I I still do really like my top three. Okay. Um, My number three is Bridesmaids. I thought this might be on your list. Another movie where whenever it's on, I watch it, and it's just, it's so fun to quote this movie, and it's, I don't know, it's so funny. Really, really like it. Mm Mm-hmm. Melissa McCarthy would have been a good, like, this was her, like, first, like, notable role. She could have gone on our breakthrough roles list a couple weeks ago. Yeah, maybe. She was in, like, Gilmore Girls or whatever for years and years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had never seen that, so I guess I would have. Yeah. Not realize that, but anyway, Bridesmaids. Really like that movie. Mm-hmm. My number three is Parasite. Came That's out, one that I'm ashamed I didn't think of. Came out last year. That movie still blows me away whenever I think about it. Like that <sighs> yes. movie is so good. I'm so happy it won Best Picture, too. Like, I love 1917, which could have been on this list as well. Um, Son of a bitch! Yeah. Seriously, when we... Okay, we were talking about what top five should we do, and I half-jokingly said this, and I was like, oh my god, there were like four movies that came out last year that could be on this list, and I loved all of them, and I forgot about all of them by the time I did this list. And I should have had Parasite and 1917 on there, because I asked him, like, 
do numbers count? Yep. I'm like, could I put 2012 on my list? Because I didn't want to give away that I was thinking of 1917. Well, then I forgot about it. So, yeah. so that, <laughs> yeah, that, that a disaster. That easily could have won Best Picture, and then we saw Parasite. I know Parasite's the best movie of the year. That needs to win. I'm very happy it did. So that is my number three. Good choice. Very, very good choice. Uh, my number two is Moneyball. Yeah, that, I did think of that movie. I love so, that movie. So fascinating. So rewatchable. I just, I love it. I love that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I could... Baseball statistics, I just, base, I don't Baseball starting this week, too, I just in know. the baseball so mode. Fun. I don't know. It's good. No, no, good that, that is, I kind of want to rewatch it now, because I <laughs> do, like, I, I think Brad Pitt's amazing in that movie. Jonah Hill in his first Oscar nomination role, like... I do, I, and for whatever reason, I think of music with that movie too, yeah, which maybe that's doesn't what make I was sense. Just thinking but of. but there's it's it's kind of like the social network where it's like just subtle. It's a dude, and it just I mm-hmm. like it. So yeah. great pick. My number two is Gladiator. That that's your number two. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was gonna be your number one. No, it is. Mm. It was. It's very close. Okay. Um, okay. I, we've reviewed that one already. It's one of my favorite all-time movies. It's a 9.8 out of 10. Uh, I, I don't care that it's mostly historically inaccurate. Uh, people kind of laugh when they think, oh, that one best picture. Yes, it did. It's a Yes, it's kind of an action movie, but there's a lot of emotion to it, too. Russell Crowe won best actor, deservingly so, for it. I, I do. I love that movie. Good choice. Mm-hmm. Good, good choice. Um, my number one is Christopher Nolan classic, Interstellar. Yeah, I, I love I that movie. There's people out there that don't that. like that movie. Which, but. yes, I, I mean, I understand that not everyone has, like, like, to me, this is, like, like, I watch this movie all the time and love it. I get that not everyone's that, but, yeah, I did not realize that there are people who, like, despise this movie. I'm like, yeah. ugh, how can you, like dislike it so much but i just i love interstellar i like just i don't know the thought of yeah sending people into different places in our galaxy and trying to save the human race and i just thought oh and the music is so good mm-hmm. oh, i Ooh. love that movie great pick my number one is whiplash such a good choice mm-hmm that's such a good it's choice. a 9.9 out of oh. 10 for me like we we that's... went to the Best Picture Festival. Sorry, one one second. Yep, we yep, went no, to the Best ahead. Picture Festival at Marcus Theaters. I think that was the first time we did it. It was. And that was really. the last showing of the day, and I hadn't really heard a lot about it. And I was like, oh, this movie about a drummer at a musical school? Like, whatever. But we saw it. And I am not kidding. I was on the edge of my seat. That entire movie... It is so good. J.K. Simmons won the Oscar for it, deservedly so. He's a dickhead asshole, but he's great in that role. Miles Teller, great in that role. Uh, the introduction to Damien Chazelle for most people. Uh, yeah, I, that movie is that movie's so good. It's fantastic. And, like, you're right. That was a movie, like, I could not wait to tell people about it. Mm-hmm. As soon as I finished saying it, you're right. Something I'd never heard of coming into it. It wasn't, like, a big production. And, yeah, it was, like, the we tried, like, as soon like, how do we get our hands on this movie? Because we need to share it with people. We need to have other people watch it. And, honestly, that was, like, the first year where, like, I really, like, dug into the actual, like, Oscar ceremony. Because I'm, like, I want this movie to win everything mm-hmm. that it's nominated for. And it was, like, you're right, like, going to the Best Picture Festival and seeing all the Best Picture nominees that year, like, that really just, like, got me totally invested in, like, the actual, like, Oscar nomination and ceremony and stuff, so. Mm-hmm. That was a very good list. Mm-hmm. I'm jealous mm-hmm. of your list because I thought about a number of, I did not think of Whiplash. I'll be honest, I never thought of that, but yeah. Parasite, 1917, I don't know how I didn't come up with those. <laughs> when it was actually time to draft up this list, yep. but that's okay. So some movies that I have as honorable mentions that were left off, uh, Inception, mm-hmm. Memento, which is which was my leading contender of a Christopher Nolan movie to be on my list. I don't think you've seen it yet. No, I ne- not. we need to watch that sometime. Yep. But Memento, fantastic. Uh, Aladdin, the cartoon, mm-hmm. the animated mm-hmm. one. Vertigo, Tootsie, uh, Rashomon, 
Akira Kurosawa movie. That movie's great. Uh, Jumanji, Braveheart, Jaws, Train Spotting, which I've seen recently. Pro- and then probably like the highest rated glaring omission for my Goodfellas. I, I, you know, it's tough for me to not include Marty on anything I do. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Goodfellas just missed a list. You know, Crash, Fargo, Casablanca, Platoon. I almost put Amadeus on my list. Mm, uh, some yeah. of the more maybe non-conventional but fun-ish. Maybe, you know, these aren't critically acclaimed movies, but they're kind of fun. Uh, Maverick, Tombstone, Ghostbusters, Speed, Predator, um, Seven, Spartacus. Yeah, I mean, the list Tremors, Willow, yeah. Arrival, Black Klansman. Oh, Arrival. Zodiac, the list goes on and on. There's a lot, but yeah. It, there it, are. There uh, really are a lot of, like, good yeah. one-word titled movies, for sure. Other than the ones you're really mad about <laughs> leaving off, were there any that you had? Um, yeah, a few others that we didn't talk about. Um, Zoolander was a close number six for me. I love that movie. It's so stupid, and the plot is just terrible. But I love that movie so much. It's so funny. Um, Brave. Uh, Blended. Honestly, pretty underrated for an Adam Sandler, Drew Barrymore movie. I actually really do enjoy that movie. Um, Grease, Babe. Um, you mentioned Black Klansman. That's such a good movie. Drumline. <laughs> Serendipity. Side- yeah, yeah, yeah. Sideways. Right. Yeah, Sideways is good. That's a good one. Um, Philadelphia, Rocky, Up. Unforgiven. Yeah, yeah, I didn't mention that. My honor, Unforgiven was very close to being on my list too. Mm-hmm. I was, there are a lot of like Disney Pixar movies that are one word titles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I noticed as I was kind of like searching through some ideas. Um, but yeah, Brave is probably on the top of that list. Like animated one word movies for me. It's a good one. Mm-hmm. So yeah, All right. those are some of my honorable mentions. All right, so that's the show for. Today, make sure to follow us or subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We should be on any podcast uh, app out there. I try to make sure we're on everything we can be. Uh, But if you can, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please make sure to leave us a review and a rating. uh, Help make us more relevant in uh, the, the podcast world so that we can pop up more often for people. Make sure to follow us uh, on social media. We're at Oscar Real Pod on both Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I'll be doing another emoji uh, guess, you know, for our next episode. So, you know, take a guess at it. And if you get it right, uh, we may give you a shout out on the show. Uh, but yeah, other than that, this has been Matt and Haley on the Oscar Real Movie Pod. <laughs>